question was on faith. I, is it possible for, say, me to carry faith, enough faith, for somebody who is lacking in it? Let me ask, answer that with a question. Okay. Do we find it in Scripture? No. Hmm? Or is it in, it is in Scripture? Well, yes, 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 okay. It is possible. Uh, it happened again more in the Gospels because these people were not even saved. Um, so someone would help carry it for them somehow. But even after the church started, you find people helping others with their faith. Uh, it, it's talked, Jesus gave us principles, two or three agree. See, we're helping each other with faith. Um, it is possible. Now, this takes us into a question I'm going to answer right out of the gates because this is going to come up. Can I cause something to happen in someone else's life against their will? In other words, someone wants a demon. Someone doesn't want Jesus. Well, I'm going to pray and fast until they're forced to. They will have to. Can you force someone against their will? No. We're made free will agents, and God never, there's never an example in Scripture where he forces us against our will. Now, he will bring them to a point of decision to where it's just easy for them to decide to submit to God and do it his way. But if they resist, they'll back out, and then he'll bring them to it again, and then they'll back out. Some people do that for years. And it's like, why don't you just get it together? But they just back away, and then they come close and back away. And you can see God working in their life. But if my friend wants to be an alcoholic, I can't stop him, force him to stop. Because now his free will would be being, be being overridden. And if there's one thing that God gave us as human beings is we've got free will. He will never override it. So you can pray them to a point of decision. You can pray them into jail. We've done that. Lord, just let them get picked up for their DUI or their DWI. Let them crash the car into a tree so they just can't get out of this. Just whatever it takes to get them to face themselves. You can pray them up into that decision. But you can't force them to make a decision they don't want to make. Doesn't work. Is there a question? You got one back there? There's one at the front here. Let's go at the front first. So, like, if there's, like, generational curses and stuff like that, um, and, like, I don't want my kid, my future kids to have any of that, do I, am I able to, look, to like, play the long game and get ahead of that now yes. before they're even here? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, again, we'll go into the specific scriptures on that, but uh, we have the right to break, again, the, the, the sins of the fathers is allowed to pass on three to four generations. Okay. So this spirit, even though we're free of it, is going to circle around every generation for three to four generations, try to trip somebody up. Okay. But we can live free that whole time. Us, our kids, our grandkids, and our great-grandkids. We can live free, but they will circle around. Okay. But yes, you can get in front of it and make their life so much better. For those of you who are the first ones out, you're struggling with stuff that I will never have to struggle with because I have generations on both sides of my family that served God. And there are blessings to that that are unfathomable. There, it's, just, it's just so much easier for someone to live for God when others have plowed the spiritual ground ahead of them. If you're the first one plowing, it's going to be a little tougher for you. Just, that, that's just the way it is. But you can. See, you're the, you're the second generation that you know of? Anybody, did your grandparents, anybody there serve God? No. Not you know uh, of? No, Great-grandparents that, that know you of. know of? Okay. Uh, great grand, I think my great-grandfather was a reverend. Okay. That's about it. Okay, so you might have something there, and it skipped a generation, nobody. 
Yeah. And your mom is. Yeah. And now it's you. So we got two generations for sure. Your kids would be number three. Okay. So <clears throat> every generation you can gain ground on it. And literally my, you know, there's, if the generations understand this and fight the fight, I'm more free than my predecessor generation was. And my children should be more free than I am. And my grandchildren should walk in a freedom that's way beyond me. Yeah. Because it, it, the blessing of the fathers passes on a thousand generations. So we're literally being blessed for the things Adam did right. We're not a thousand generations away from Adam yet. So everybody in history who's ever done anything right, that accumulates on us where God limited the, the ancestral demonic side to four generations. But now if it can reestablish, let's use an example. Let's say that someone was huge into, uh, we always pick big things that are, are, are not, you know, the big to the church, but everything's the same. So let's go with one that the church usually doesn't consider sin at all. Let's say someone was huge into gossip. You say, what's gossip? Gossip is talking to someone else about a different person, and you have no intention of doing anything about it. It's a negative speech, not a positive. It's not like, oh, man, Dave Warren is the most awesome guy. I love the guy. He's serving God. He's after it with his whole heart. It's not that. It's, you know who Jason is? Yeah. Well, I don't want to say too much. But that guy's a jerk. <laughs> he did this to me, and he said this to me, and do you know, you know what I'm doing? Unless you're willing to go with me to Jason and fix this, if we have no intentions of talking to him at all, this is just me and you. I, I just got to have somebody I got to talk to. You're gossiping. And God hates it. Okay? So let's say that grand, great grandma had a gossip problem. And grandma picked it up. But mom said no, or dad, whoever's in that line, and taught me to say no. So we've only had two generations where this thing connected. The next two generations, we unhooked from it. And my children, no, we're not doing this. So now we're three in. But in my grandchildren, somebody picks it up. They just love to talk about other people in a negative fashion. It just hooked up for another four generations. You just gave it right to hang around and see if it can get back in again for four more generations. You said, well, you can take authority over it and stop it. You can. But God said it has access for four generations. So you can get it out and be free of it as long as nobody hooks up again to it. Now, if we can get past four generations, we can pull gossip out of the family line, and it's, it's like the craving, the desire for it, the driving to do it goes away. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but that compelling drive, that's usually how you can tell the demon's involved. There's a compelling drive. Now, this can be flesh, too, because remember, Jesus sweat drops of blood not resisting demons. He sweat drops of blood resisting his flesh. His flesh did not want to be crucified. And that old nature, that, that, he, that physical body, he had to be tempted like us. He resisted that thing so hard, he sweat drops of blood. That had nothing to do with demons. He wasn't warring demons. That was his flesh. So it can go either way, and there's some ways you can divide it. But demons are usually very driving. And, and it is, it's just like, I have to do this. Yeah, you better check a little deeper on that. It might not be just you. There might be a critter there who isn't helping you. Um, and we can get free of all that stuff. Just like you said, we can get in front of it for our kids and, and teach them. But somebody has to carry the baton. 
and keep it in the air. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. Um, Because you know what gossip causes, don't you? You know why God's so against it? Gossip causes division. It divides people. I'm going to gossip again with Molly about Sarah. And you need to stay away from Sarah because she's really bad. (laughs) I've got stories. Because negative information about another person is never, Sarah's really bad. She treated me so bad. Would you go with me and help me fix our relationship? No, that's not where gossip goes. Gossip is to divide you away, and you and me are going to buddy up and thumb our nose and say, that's what gossip does. And where you find strife and division, what does it say? You find every evil thing. Now stop and think about that in the realm of demons. Where you have strife and division, and you're habitually living in this. This isn't just, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have said that, God forgive me, I'm sorry. No, this is you. You just love the drama. You love getting your little harem, your little group together, and other people are outside of it, and it makes you feel safe, and whatever the deal is. This is how you live. It opens you up to every evil thing. You can get spirits of suicide out of that. You can get spirits of perversion out of that. You can get spirits of murder out of that. You can get every kind of spirit there is. You opened yourself up to it. Because you submitted to that kingdom. So go back to the question I asked at the beginning. Why do you think Christians in America actually have problems with demons? You know how many gossips we have in church? (laughs) Yeah, you see what she wore? That ugly old thing, she wore it twice this month. What is wrong? I mean, my question is, women, what is wrong with you that you care? Something's broken. Because you're actually trying to elevate yourself above the other person over what they wore. They wore it twice. I would never do that. Ooh, let's bow down and worship you. It's weird. Guys have their own way, but women have some really dumb things. I mean, I'm, I never said dumb women. I said dumb things. If there's one thing... I know most honest pastor's wives despise is their congregational women always watching what they wear. Why do you care? Really? Clothes is an eternal issue? Really? In the back, got a question. We want to stay out of strife and division because it opens us up to multitudes of things. Go ahead. If the little red button is red, you're good to go. The one by your thumb. See, that happens when you play with it. It wasn't on. It was on, yeah. Okay, go for it. No, now it's on. I was actually, it's okay, can I answer what you just said on why women do that? Why do women do that? My opinion is because women want to be seen and they want to be, right, like, look at me, I'm enough. And they don't believe that that's their identity in Christ. So then they look at the congregation and they look at the pastor's wife and they're like, she's seen, she's enough, right, because we put them on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So then you try to go, right, assert yourself over them and be like, well, I want to be more seen than that woman. Or be like her. Or be like her, mm-hmm. but really it's an identity problem where they don't find it in Jesus and they're trying to just assert that type of dominance over other women to make themselves feel better. Mm. But really it, it's insecure. Interesting opinion. That's my opinion. I'm sure others have other opinions, but it's a good opinion. 
I don't know. I'm not a woman, so my mind doesn't work that way. If I find out that guys are aggravated because I wore something more than once, I'll just wear it, same thing for a month straight. Just get over it. I'm not here to impress you with my clothes. It's just kind of, that's just kind of me. <laughs> Go ahead. I just wanted to make a comment on gossip. If that divides us, then that's what the news is, is gossip. Absolutely. Yeah. The news media has perfected it to divide this nation. Go ahead. I had a question. I've always heard it's the sins of the father that are passed down, but what about the sins of the mother? How does that work? Good because question. We do a lot of binding of the sins of the father side, but there is. Is it <clears throat> generic? For both? I'll talk about it briefly now. Um, we we will study it a little bit when we talk about generational stuff. Um, I don't know why it works this way, and if you're a feminist, you won't like this. Just saying, it's not mother God. Right. It's father God. You know, even though I guess there's Bibles written now that make it female God, mother God. Um, it's not mother God, it's father God. When you get married, scripturally speaking, I'll give you a hint, 1 Corinthians 11 is one of the places that talks about it. When you get married, the divine order of accountability goes How? Christ, the man, the woman, the children. It doesn't make the woman less than. It doesn't make the woman unequal with. But in a marriage setting, there has to be an order for flow. So what the wife is comes under and supports the man. So what she is, they become one. She supports him. He's the first one held accountable by Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 says, Man is the glory of Jesus, and woman is the glory of the man. It's how the order, it's how it flows. So when accountability comes, the man is held accountable first, and then the wife. Now in marriage, she comes in underneath him, they become one. So what she brings into the marriage will transfer on to the children also. But God's going to view it from, why aren't you dealing with this, man? Why are you letting her be the way she is if she's wrong? And if he's wrong, why aren't you helping him get back on track? But from God's perspective, in a marriage setting, he's looking at the man first. Well, marriage is where children are supposed to come out of. You have to say it that way now. I mean, I know children can come out of any type of one-night stand or otherwise. But the best way is marriage, where you have a father and a mother. She is not less than, and he's not supposed to rule over her, and he doesn't have the right to boss her around. But her job is to come in underneath and support him as he is underneath being accountable to Christ. So if something's going to pass on, the way God looks at it is the man's going to be held accountable for that, sins of the fathers. Even though there's stuff on my mom's side of the family that passed on or tried to. I'll give you an example. My, and, and this is, okay, let's go do this. Uh, my father was fearless in most cases. Now, there were a few things as I got older I can look back and go, he was afraid of something there. But overall, he was fearless. He wasn't afraid of the dark. He wasn't afraid of spiders. He wasn't afraid of monsters. He wasn't, he was fearless. He'd just laugh. My mother was very fearful. It, 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 it flowed in her family line. It did not so much flow with my father. If, if it was in the family line, it sure didn't get on him. But it was on my mom. I mean, there was numerous times during the night 
I'd get woken up because dad was having to go through the whole house because she was sure she heard somebody or thought somebody's hiding in the house someplace. And he had to go through the whole place, came in the bedroom, checked the closet, had to do everything before she could go back to sleep because she was fearful. Okay? So <clears throat> there, was, there was, when you have, and, and fear, we'll talk about this on Sundays when we're talking about why people don't get healed. Uh, we'll, we'll address this some. But fear, we say, is the opposite of faith. That is actually not true. Fear is faith. It's just putting your faith in the wrong thing. People who are fearful actually, actually believe there's a monster in the closet. They believe it fully. And the more they, you know, as a child, the more you'll never get them to go open the closet door. Well, just go open the closet door and look. I'll stand right here. Oh, no, there's a monster. I can't. They'll kill me before. They believe it. We call that fear. That's actually faith. They believe it 100%. They're just believing the wrong thing. Okay? But let's go with the thought of fear. When my mom passed, so there was, she struggled with believing the wrong thing, so she was missing the mark. Missing the mark, we learned last Sunday, is one of the Greek words for sin. So, you know, she wasn't this big sinner, covered by grace. I believe she's in heaven. But she was fearful. She was fearful all her life. Well, because she never beat that, demons attract to that. Okay? And that would be what's considered sins of the ancestors or fathers. Because dad was never able to help get her past that. So when she passed, <clears throat> now here's a little tidbit you got to know. Generational sins, there's a spirit that goes with to try to make that happen in the next generation. Does anybody know what that spirit is called in the scripture? Familiar spirit. It is familiar with the family, the family line. It could have been in it for generations. It's familiar with the weaknesses. It's familiar with the, 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 the iniquity or the things it's bent towards. And it will try to help perpetrate that sin on the next generation. And the spirit will go with when the person passes or shortly before. They won't leave until they know, yeah, it's pretty much over. They might be on their deathbed, uh, might be a few days, might be hours. Some of them hang on until the person is gone, and then they'll try jumping. Where do they go? Next generation. They're trying to get into the next generation. So my mom passed away in our house, and we were living in Colorado, and then... Uh, her body was taken back to where I grew up, North Dakota, and she was buried there and so forth. So she passed away, and we wrapped things up, and in a couple of days, then we left, and we went to North Dakota, and we were up there for, I don't know, a week, week and a half, whatever, uh, and the funeral and everything took place. And then we came back. Um, Colorado was like a 12-hour, 11-hour drive from our home. So we left in the morning. We got back. This happened in March. So by the time we got back, it was like 9 or 10 at night. It was dark. And our kids were all little. I think Eric was eight or something like that. So we were stumbling them up to the door, and I unlocked the door. And I stepped in. I opened the door, opened this way. I stepped into the door, front door, and literally it went everything. My hair stood up. Goosebumps hit me. It felt like I stepped into hell. It felt horrible. And I thought, maybe this is me. So I said nothing, and I helped bring the kids in, and Mary stepped in, and she said, what in the world is in this house? I said, what does it feel like? Fear. I said, guess where that came from? That came from mother, and it's trying to get on to me. Because if it can establish a landing spot, it will have another generation. She said, what are you going to do? I said, can you put the kids to bed? All you got to do is kind of get them there. 
They'll drop in. They'll, they'll go to sleep. Won't be a problem. Can you put the kids to bed? I said, I want to deal with something. She said, okay. So I went to the place she died. She died in our bedroom. Now, people sell their houses over stuff like this because they're spirits that came from somebody died. And that body's no longer inhabitable or tormentable. So let's jump. And they wait for their opportunity. And depending upon what they are, you can feel them. So I went to the bedroom. I turned the light off. I went to the spot. And I said, what are you doing here? No. Literally, what I felt inside I have never felt fear like that in my life, before or since. I, what it felt like is my adrenaline was through the roof, and there was a bear in the dark right there ready to kill me. It just was like I was so full of fear. But what was it trying to do? It was trying to jump. And if I wouldn't have resisted it, if I would have run, I'd open the door because I'd have run out of fear. And that's what it was, was fear that would open the door to it. It was creepy, weird fear. And so I prayed through the whole house. It never lifted. It was just creepy weird. I told Mary, I said, I'm going out and I'm going to anoint the property. Grabbed the oil, went out the back door. And again, you have to do the opposite of what it's trying to get you to do. Well, give me a big flashlight. Turn the lights on. I don't, I don't, I don't. No, you go in the dark because it's trying to get you afraid enough. You turn all the lights on to protect yourself. That doesn't protect you. Well, it makes me feel better. I know, but you can't go by feelings. You go by faith. So she said, you want the lights on? I said, nope, I want to be in the dark. You want a flashlight? Nope, I want to be in the dark. She said, as creepy as this feels, are you sure? I said, I want to be in the dark. I went out the back of the property and again spoke and went to the four corners, poured the oil. It did not leave until the last spot I poured the oil. And this is how I always do it with a house or property or whatever. It's all sealed up, and I will say that. Uh, this is sealing it up. This is for God's kingdom only, inside where the oil has been poured. And this is sealing it up. And before I pour the last part of it, you better get out. If you don't, and you stay in here when I pour this oil, I'm going to pray you're obliterated. You're just pew, vaporized. You will cease to exist from my perspective. What God does with you, it's up to him. But you will go pew. If I'm in a house, I'll open the front door. Get out in the name of Jesus. You would be amazed how you can feel them go. Sometimes there's literally a breeze. It's like a, you can feel the breeze. Out. Close the door, anoint the door with oil, and seal it. Well, I did that with the property. When I poured the last oil and sealed it, I will never succumb to the fear that tormented my mother. Amen. No. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear is not of my God. And just went through, you'd be amazed how many scriptures come to your mind when you need them. And I poured the oil and said, get out, or you will be dealt with. And I poured the oil, and it just went, and the whole thing became peaceful. And I've never had a problem with it since. That was sins of the fathers, but in reality, it wasn't my dad's sin. It was my mom's. But he and her were one, and God viewed him as the one accountable and responsible. So if this thing's going to pass on, it's because Urban, that was my dad's name, never dealt with it correctly. Doesn't mean he's a bad person. He didn't know how to deal with it correctly. I mean, the, the, the stuff we're talking about was never taught when I was growing up. And I doubt it's being taught much now. He didn't know how. 
to, to make sure he's clean, get in its face, tell it it has no right in his wife. I am putting an end to this. You're going to leave her alone and just cast it out of the marriage, out of the property, out of the... It came in the lineage in her side. It was a familiar spirit. Get it out. He didn't know how to do that. Nobody had ever taught him. We're going to go more specific on that next week on, well, what do you say? What do you, how do you handle it? What do you do with it? We'll go more specific and give examples. Um, but I just gave you some. I went to where she died, and I said, no. There will be no spirit of fear in this, in this house, in this generation, in me, in my wife, in my children. There will be none. No. And... That's where I started, and then I went around the house, and I anointed the house. Now, interestingly enough, this is another side thought. We haven't got into teaching this yet. For whatever reason, spirits use doorways and windows, specifically doorways. You say, is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. When the spirit of death in the land of Egypt came the night before they ran, where did they have to put the blood over? The door. And they covered the door with blood, and the spirit couldn't get into the house. Spirits don't need doors. They can go right through the wall. There's a spiritual principle. I don't know what it is, but there's a spiritual principle. They use doors, and they'll use windows, too. Uh, Jesus talked about it. When a demon is cast out, he'll go wandering through dry and arid places, and he'll come back and look back in. Well, if you go in Jesus' day, they didn't have windows in the doors. Those were solid wood doors. But they did have windows. And he's saying it's going to look back in the house. Well, how's it going to look back in the house? Through the window. To get back in, it might have to go in through the door. Now, I don't know why that principle is that way. But if you're going to clean your house, and it says it in the book, you're going to have to anoint your doors and call the opening shut to keep them out. They won't come through the wall even though they can. They won't. They want a, a door, so to speak. And we'll talk about that more. But, uh, yeah, was there a question up there? No? Uh, we got a few minutes yet. Is there another question? I you got one? one? Go ahead. Yeah, can I ask a question about tattoos? Yep. Yeah, that was a hot topic a few minutes ago. Bring yeah, that up. so uh, can you elaborate more on what it means, like getting a tattoo for the dead? Like, So, for example, if you have a tattoo and then the person dies, do you then need to cover it up? If you get one for someone who has passed, do you... Can you I'd get rid of it. Personally, I'd get rid of it. Because what you're doing is you're honoring death, not life. It's like it's like a skeleton. It's It's... It's like, uh, and, and I've talked with some people about this. Well, is there a problem with me keeping my mother's ashes in an urn on the fireplace mantle? Why do you want a dead body on your fireplace mantle? What is this? Why would you do that? Well, I want to remember my mother. I got news for you. She ain't in the urn. That's just dirt. This is just dirt. When this ceases to support my spirit, I either go to heaven or hell. But if I'm in a casket, guess what? That is not me. Yep. I'm not in there. And if they cremate me, <clears throat> I'm not in the urn. It's just ashes of a dead person. So the question is, should we or shouldn't we? No, that's not really the question. The question is, why would we want to? What what is this? Are we going to mourn them? Uh, what is there some kind of attachment? I feel like she's around. I had one guy say to me, he said, my wife passed, we buried her. I missed her so much. I just kept wanting to be with her. And he said, one night I felt her get in bed with me. And I welcomed her and he said, every night since that night, when I turn the lights off and get in bed, he said, I can feel her coming. The bed sink, literally sinks in, and the blankets move like she got in bed with me. And it's such a comfort to me. <laughs> it's like, I got bad news for you. 
that's not mama. <laughs> that's a familiar spirit. That was, that's a spirit that's imitating mama. And you're living with it. This is not going to end well. <laughs> I mean, just say it that way. But uh, now what was I saying before I got onto that? Pardon me? Tattoos. Um, yes. Why would we want the urn? Why would we want to tattoo ourselves? The, the, the question is why. Now, I have a message. That's where I was going. Let's see if I can find it. <clears throat> um, if you go to the website, come on, where are you? There you are. If you go to the website and look under messages, And then the full catalog, yes. I was going to say, Kevin probably there already in his head because he's the one who works with this stuff. There is a series called Correct and Incorrect Judging. Um, it is a series with 11 messages. So what we were teaching in that series, which, you know, I wish we had more services and everybody would actually show up because there's so much stuff that really should be talked about. We are forbidden to judge people, but we're commanded to judge things. We have to, to be spiritual, judge everything, the scripture says. But we're forbidden to judge a person. So we divided those two and showed that from scripture and how that judging people puts us under a curse. Judging things is what we're called to do. Well... I said, let's make application. What about tattoos, Pastor? So that's how it ended up in that series. Aren't people with tattoos going to hell? That's what I was taught growing up. You get a tattoo, man, you're, you're, you're probably three-quarters of the way in already. It's, it's, you can't have a tattoo. And then people would come home from the military who were Christians, and they'd walk in with a tattoo, and I'd say, hey, Mom, what about that guy? He's a Christian. He's got a tattoo on his arm. He's got a big anchor or whatever, something to identify with his unit. And, well, he shouldn't have it. <laughs> it's like, well, that's a good answer. <laughs> Told me nothing. <laughs> so we got into talking about tattoos. And one of the things we're forbidden to do is tattoo ourselves for the dead. Now, the way they used to do it in the Old Testament is they would cut themselves and then put a dye into it so that it became, because if you just put a dye on yourself, I mean, let's go find some black coal and we'll put it on ourselves for the dead. Well, in two, three days, it's going to be gone. But they cut themselves and they'd put a dye into that and that would represent, you know, whatever that, picture was would represent dad or mom or grandpa and that way they were honoring them or this is there's various there's various uh explanations for what it really is and how to do it i would love to talk to a rabbi sometime and say what does tattooing for the dead really mean in jewish vernacular i've read numerous descriptions of it but it, in a nutshell it has to do with you see this flower? This flower represents Uncle Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Fred was like a father to me. <laughs> you know what you did? You tattooed yourself for the dead. God's against that. Let Uncle Fred rest in peace. Let him go. Wherever he went, up or down, let him go. Don't drag Uncle Fred with you. That's tattooing for the dead. Now, God tattooed himself with all the names of us who have eternal life. God tattooed himself for life. Jesus wears the King of Kings on his thigh. That's one of his tattoos. He has other tattoos. Well, he's king of kings forever. He's living. And he is announcing something 
by the way, you look at Jesus and go, oh, yeah, that's right. See that tattoo? <laughs> He's king of kings. Don't forget it. He be the big boss. <laughs> so there are, there are things that are for life. Now, if you want to get a tattoo for the day you got saved, this is the day I found God. And this picture represents that. I don't think there's any issue with that. If you want to get a tattoo because it's part of your military group, I don't think there's an issue with that. Um, Christians can have tattoos and be Christian. Now, if you want to know the scriptural end of it, listen to that message. But when it goes into something about death, God's against that. Like inside awareness? Yeah, skull and crossbones. I just saw it the other day. You should have the mic because there's going to be people who are going to be listening and they're going to say, what's he answering? And who's, what's, what's the question? Sorry. And then we'll get to you next. Uh, what about like the suicide awareness semicolon that's supposed to represent like coming through it and being victorious or a warrior? So you're that? representing life. Okay. You're coming through it. You're Good. being victorious. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, no, I personally don't have any tattoos. My mother succeeded. I'm just uncomfortable with them. Now, my kids, I think all of them have tattoos. But I said, you're not getting a tattoo until you're minimum 18. It'd be better if you were 20 or 21. Because once you writ it on there, it's hard to get on writ. Yep. And I'm in love with Susie. <laughs> and you break up and marry Jenny. She may not care for that. <laughs> So it's like, that's all right. You can decorate. It's just dirt. You can decorate it if you want. We decorate the dirt around our house, plant flowers. It's just dirt. You can decorate it. But use your head as you decorate it because um, some things just, you know. I'll, uh, here's a scriptural principle. Man looks on the outward, God looks at the heart. How many people do you see running successful businesses who have their head tattooed, their face tattooed? Why? Because it creeps most people out in this generation. Right or wrong, I, I'm not saying they're right or wrong for doing it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying man looks on the outward. So when you're getting a tattoo, remember, people are going to look at this. They're going to come to conclusions about you by what they're seeing. If you're a Christian wearing a Budweiser shirt, people are going to see that, yep. and they're going to come to conclusion you're a drinker as a Christian. Well, a tattoo is permanent. Budweiser shirt, you can change it to Coors. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a joke. Anybody gets their undies in a bundle now. That's a joke. But... Man does look on the outward. We do. Um, so you have to be careful with tattoos. But if you want the full story, read that. I mean, listen to that message. Okay, you're on. So I